Dinka Zhultsenka uh, is an ordinary Ukrainian trying to help his country. He provides tech equipment for defenders and is a former software engineer. And today we're going to be talking about his experiences, the experiences of his friends, and what's going to happen next for both Ukraine and for him as well. Dinka, welcome to the channel. I'm very privileged and happy to be here. Thank you for having me over. Not not at all. I've been following you on, on Twitter or X, as it's now called, for some time. And you post a lot about volunteering. You post a lot about uh, support that's required for the front. You're very much involved in, uh, as I say, providing tech equipment. So we're going to talk about Starlinks and the importance of those and the role of those. But there's, the, there's a lot of stuff going on. You're also getting married. And you are, I believe, joining the armed forces of Ukraine. So there's a lot to kind of unpack there. But let's start with you. What's your profession? What do you what do you do in civilian life or your former life before the invasion? As you correctly pointed out, uh, mostly treat this as a former life now. Uh, so for two years, uh, the most recent two years of my life, I have been busy with uh, helping Ukrainian uh, defenders with uh, different technological equipment with the technological solutions to help defend Ukraine. This all started as a, just a small personal initiative of uh, me trying to help my friends who are fighting and then slowly and organically evolved uh, into uh, crowdfunding a couple of million US dollars uh, to buy exactly the technological equipment like drones, uh, Starlinks, portable power stations, radios, and uh, so on and so forth. And it made a great impact, <laughs> I guess. Well, let's, let's unpack that because I know many people who've generated thousands of dollars. I know people who've generated tens of thousands. I know a tiny handful of people who've generated hundreds of thousands. Millions, that's another order. So how did you go about that? How did it happen? Um, so initially it all started, as I said, just a little personal initiative and organically just went on and on and on where I have been able through the social media to deliver on my promises. Initially, I just started uh, posting in English with uh, probably because mostly uh, the anxiety that uh, I had uh, in the very beginning of the invasion as I took it personally. And uh, then I have started posting uh, how I helped my friends who are fighting uh, with uh, my own uh, money. And uh, many people kind of got uh, inspired uh, because of this on the social media. And they tried to persuade me um, on, hey, how can we send you money? And uh, uh, so you spend it the same way as you did with the, your own funds to help your friends. And I was kind of um, uh, contemplating this uh, decision for quite a bit and uh, in the end uh, agreed uh, and uh, just people started sending me money and I have been very specific with uh, what I was about to do with it and I was able to deliver exactly on my promises as we had agreed before and I think this step by step it won the trust of people and eventually when the amounts of uh, money they got a bit bigger uh, when we started like talking like uh, uh, almost at a uh, hundred thousand us dollars i uh, have decided that it just makes sense to launch an official organization because of the different uh, tax reason and just being official and legal in your country is always better <laughs> as a ukrainian i completely agree to that uh, so I did the organization, all of the legal aspects, and then uh, I did uh, a bit of a promise to myself. So I would have a commitment for exactly one year to do my best in creating this organization, this product, if you say so, uh, into what people would like and what would actually make impact on the battlefield. So the commitment one year uh, that's a term that is big enough to see the real value and uh, 
uh, I just went and did it. And it, in the end, in the first year, we have been able to generate uh, about, I think, 700,000 uh, US dollars, which was a tremendous result uh, starting as a literally nobody on the social media. I had like maybe uh, a thousand followers that I have met throughout my IT career on various conferences and just my friends, you know. So nothing that special. I'm no like politician or no public figure. I'm just an ordinary guy <laughs> that happened to be um, in this uh, crappy uh, shit war situation and uh, just tried to do my best to help my friends. And eventually uh, I found my big focus because in the very beginning of the invasion, it was very chaotic and literally everything was needed, uh, but uh, I found the focus in uh, uh, doing exactly the items that I have a very good expertise in and that I can suggest not only the material support, but also the solutions that are built on top of the technology that I can provide. So this is how it all started with uh, uh, Scarlinks in uh, uh, early uh, in like spring 2022 when no one was literally doing this and I felt like a very desperate geek back uh, in the days uh, when I brought those Starlinks in my personal uh, uh, SUV that I have uh, that we bought with uh, my girlfriend uh, a couple of years ago before the invasion. Uh, so I, I just packed my own truck with those Starlinks and went to the front line to see all of my friends and taught them how to use this and what they can do with that thing. And uh, that was literally the first time when many of Ukrainian defenders saw the Starlink and this enabled so many of the workflows for them. And this, I think, spring 2022 was just about the time when uh, uh, this... Um, battlefield transparency that we see right now in the Ukrainian battlefield, uh, it started to shape with the very first uh, uh, live streams from the drones uh, being done through Starlink to some commandment post or, uh, and I still recall how hilarious it was to do this through uh, Google Meet, through like Discord and so on. We, we were literally crafting things out of... Uh, publicly available commercial products. And this was, I think, the bit of the expertise that I was able to contribute, how to glue this all together. And this is what I've learned uh, from uh, my tech career and uh, from just being a tech geek uh, back in the days and now still. So that well, is I'd love to dig into our... that. I mean, I'd love to dig into the into the tech mindset because my own background is in uh, tech marketing, so I, I have some sort of uh, appreciation for for that. But I think the first thing is how important has it been for fundraising and for actually making an impact, as you said. That firstly, because people are providing this to you personally, that there's transparency. You're showing what what you need, what you're going to do with it, and then you're providing demonstrable proof that that equipment is going to the right place. And secondly, how important is it that you have connection with people at the front so they can tell you exactly what's needed and how that might be changing month in, month out? Uh, I think that is a very important thing uh, that you highlighted the transparency, just because I have been focusing on this since day two. And uh, when I gave myself that commitment that I'm going to do one year of only this and try to make it as good as possible, I obviously fell into this uh, product uh, manager kind of a mindset where I tried to use my empathy to think as a donor. And as I'm, uh, even before the invasion, I was donating to uh, many organizations myself to uh, causes that I think are worthy. Um, I thought that, yes, indeed, the transparency in how organization is run and uh, what is the impact that uh, my contribution is doing. And uh, obviously, the financial transparency is so important. So I have decided to focus on this and together with my friends. Initially, it was like uh, 
I was just uh, having a bunch of Excel spreadsheets and I was sharing it publicly on Twitter because that was kind of the main channel of communication. Uh, but then uh, together with the friends, um, we have created a website, literally took us a couple of days and I wrote all of the text for the website. We crafted that on like WordPress or something. Uh, and uh, then uh, we created this kind of a transparency system. So if you go to zigaspaw.com slash transparency, there is a bunch of uh, charts that say that, hey, we have raised this amount, we have spent this amount, this uh, uh, this is the uh, list of latest donation, and you can scroll it all day long. There, there is a list uh, of uh, um, uh, the most recent uh, spendings, and you can scroll it all day long as well. So you literally can see that, uh, hey, yesterday we spent like 20 bucks on the sending the post, uh, uh, so sending the parcel somewhere to the phone line, you know? So that is, I think, a very initial uh, part and what I had in mind when designing this kind of a system. And it's all interactive and it's all automated. So if people donate, it shows up on the website, they see that their donation have appeared. They also see that we have bought this, this is the price that we paid, this is the um, the thing that we bought and so on and so forth. It's all automated and it's all kind of, I think a competitive advantage uh, if we are uh, obviously comparing things to other organizations. I think that's enormously uh, important. And uh, uh, the second thing is that um, my silly brain does not remember the second question. So I'll <laughs> kindly the ask you question. to... <laughs> yes. The second question is that crucial connection with the front line. The requirements have changed you know, a lot. Um, we'll get on to tech and evolution of warfare in a minute, but just having that primary communication with people on the front line, we're able to say, okay, right, we've now got that. Now we need this. You know, just just that sort of feedback process. Absolutely, this is so important, and uh, we got that uh, right uh, from the first day. Just because, as the Ukrainian, I am kind of I naturally and organically have many friends who serve in the military, many friends who have been serving before the invasion, and many who have enlisted right after the invasion happened, and. Uh, just talking to them, you know, just being sociable um, really helps because they are able to tell you so many of the insights. There is no language or any cultural barrier or anything. And if you uh, have all of that input and, uh, you know, what kind of jobs they're going through, you can add a bit of your analytical thinking. You can come up with a, a solution for this, uh, like today your problems like, hey, we don't have any network uh, or any connectivity in the trenches because radio works only like for two kilometers. So what we ca can we do? And then you kind of start thinking about, suggest a few solutions, uh, find the most um, cost-effective one, and in the end, end up with like Starlink or radio retranslator or anything and like that and uh, then you send it they literally test it on the battlefield give you instant feedback on this and uh, you know what really works and what doesn't uh, so i think this really helps and uh, as the organization crew kind of uh, just a bit bigger we're i think like five and a half full-time employees uh, at the moment and uh, uh, it literally all of us are deeply involved into the war by just having uh, either close friends fighting or uh, like relatives or loved ones fighting the war so all of the people are deeply um, in the context of this war and know a lot of things that uh, um, help us run the organization because we get these kind of uh, Frontline perspectives, and the same happens when we go into any kind of a expedition, because uh, most of the time, for me, the goal of any expedition that we do to the front line, when we pack our van to the fullest with all of the equipment that we need to deliver to them, is not really delivering the equipment. It's very important, but I consider this more of a like a field trip uh, where we 
mostly talk to the people that we help and we dig through their perspectives on how uh, how the equipment that we deliver to them how it makes the impact and what we do what we can do to maximize the impact and maybe there is some kind of untapped niche or any prototype that we can do together with the unit at a um, in a cost effective setup that might give us new knowledge and uh, exactly that was the case when uh, um, in uh, the end of 2022 the very first uh, uh, fixed wing uh, uh, drones uh, with uh, Starlink mounted on top of it started to appear so you can basically disassemble Starlink and uh, 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 remove the and that stick that holds it uh, and uh, remove all of the motors and uh, put it on top of your normal fixed wing UAV that you would use for radio controllers and so on. Um, so you can do this. And this was the prototype that we did actually in 2022. And this was hilarious because many, we have seen so many of uh, iterations of that um uh, of that product over two years of uh, its uh, lifetime. So, Iterations think... is a really interesting process, isn't it? Because this might be familiar from the tech or the software world or, uh, you know, when you're in a fast-paced engineering environment where you test and learn with a high degree of agility. But this is a new paradigm for warfare, isn't it? Traditionally, military bureaucracies are far, far slower to adopt innovation. And this sort of iterative process is, I would say, almost unknown, certainly in the space of days and weeks. Previously, it would have taken months and years to adopt this pace of innovation. So how important is it that you're able to use commercial components? And how important is it, this, this aspect you talk about, which is moving very rapidly, but very economically, and trying to find the cheapest uh, solution that has the highest impact. Now, I can definitely agree to the uh, agile thing uh, here in the warfare, and uh, usually it would be done like a more in a waterfall kind of a style, but we just cannot afford it because our lives and our freedom depend on it. So, if um, something poses an existential threat to your life and country, then you need to start getting really creative <laughs> about it uh, and if your life depends on it. Uh, and uh, many of uh, uh, Ukrainian military servicemen, they are actually um, in, in, in literally like yesterday, they, they were civilians and uh, they do not have this uh, old school military bureaucracy kind of uh, day rather hop through uh, all of that uh, bullshit and try to focus on things that actually work and that actually save lives and make impact. I think Ukraine is um, a good example of uh, using commercial technology to shape the battlefield. In fact, uh, it already shaped uh, the new type of warfare that we are seeing in Ukraine with uh, all of the drones and there is that kind of a concept of uh, battlefield uh, transparency that um, uh, Ukraine's uh, former commander-in-chief uh, Zaluzhny uh, mentioned in his uh, The Economist uh, column uh, where he said that literally we do see every part of the front and uh, the enemy is more or less on par with us in this aspect. Uh, which uh, kind of disables the option to launch this surprise attack kind of a thing, which uh, would normally happen in World War II or in World War One. Instead, we are kind of caught up in this trench warfare where drones monitor every piece of the front line 24-7. And this is actually something that we have enabled with uh, the NGO that I run, the Gaspo, uh, we have enabled this through doing the full cycle of the equipment that they need for this battlefield transparency, starting from the drone that you need to physically fly and film the whole uh, the whole thing, 
uh, with uh, the tablet that you need to pilot the drones you connect that to the controller uh, with uh, the uh, portable power station with the starlink that you need to uh, fire up so you can stream the footage directly to any command and center and actually right now it works like that that uh, you stream to a centralized system and then uh, there are actors in this system that could watch this video if you exchange the security keys with them and so on and then uh, all of the commandment centers we also did that part with a big ass 4k tvs like 70 inches or something uh, and uh, install them in the commandment center by the laptops so it could uh, the powerful laptops that they could run like 10 4k streams at the same time uh, do all of the networking equipment that they need to do so they do not lose any uh, speed on download and upload for the Wi-Fi signal or anything like that. So we try to find uh, these kind of solutions and uh, uh, what we did ad hoc in 2022. Now in the Ukrainian armed forces is a de facto standard and many organizations also started doing this and it, it made enormous impact. It literally shaped the battlefield based on the commercial technology. There is nothing military related. It's uh, literally organizations like ours who have contributed greatly to this. And before we move on to the sort of more long distance effect, does this also create dependencies and risk? We saw during a, an attack on Crimea, in 2022, that Starlinks were switched off uh, when they came in in proximity to Russian um, territory occupied by Russia. So there's, there's there's some risk there in commercial components as well, isn't there? And I know also that you've been trying to move away from any kind of components from China because again, there's a, a you know a major risk of where some of those components might be sourced. Absolutely, you're absolutely right. And in ideal world, you would build your own product that uh, launch your own satellite that uh, flies specifically for your military purposes, but it's uh, nowhere close to being the case for Ukrainians. So we have to improvise and take all of the shortcuts and consider that as a trade-off. Yes, there, uh, there is a risk that uh, uh, Starlinks might be cut off uh, uh, the next day or anything like that. There is a risk that uh, uh, Chinese would uh, update their drones so we could not use it anymore here. This is happening for two years straight, but it didn't happen yet. And all of the times that it happened, we were able to anyhow overcome it. Uh, to say the least, uh, the products like Starlink or uh, those Chinese drones, they are very cost effective. If we are talking about the uh, war economy, uh, Starlink is something that really costs so cheap. It's ridiculously cheap for such a good product that can make such a good impact in the war. It's literally you're sitting in the trench and you're able to I don't know, call Pentagon or anything like that uh, from uh, call anywhere in the world where you want. And uh, with uh, these cheap Chinese drones, it's uh, the same like with Mavic 3 drones, uh, which are widely popular in this uh, warfare that we are having here. They are so cost effective and it's impossible to make it at such price in any country in the world uh, just because they are freaking experts in doing this. It is obvious that Russians also use uh, e e Starlings. They use uh, the same uh, commercial drones. They copy a lot of things. But that, I think, uh, the the impact that we can make was just being the first ones on the on that technology thing. It, it is so beneficial. And it literally saved lives in the very beginning in like 2022 when Russians had no Starlings. That was such a game changer to the whole war and uh, enabled to connect so many units together and uh, gave so much more of a um, situational awareness uh, to the units. So I think it sucks that we have to depend on those uh, 
uh, shitty uh, communist countries. It sucks that we have to depend on this shitty visionary uh, called uh, Elon, but it is what it is. Uh, uh, we are uh, uh, not in the position uh, to do everything the right way because we just don't have the resources. But this has revolutionized the economics of warfare. You've got drones that cost hundreds of dollars uh, that are taking out tanks that are worth millions. You've got, uh, you know, larger, heavier duty ones that are taking out oil refineries that are worth tens, if not hundreds of millions. You've got the sea baby drones that are taking out, again, ships and um, you know, marine platforms that, again, worth tens or even hundreds of millions. It's it's an extraordinary revolution in the economics of, of warfare. And you can see that some of these legacy platforms, like a lot of the tanks, you know, Russian tanks, a lot of the Russian heavy armor, the missile systems, they're, they're just... They're just sort of outclassed by this new style of, of warfare. Absolutely agree to that. Nothing really to add. It's uh, the way that Ukraine can wage very asymmetric warfare, kind of uh, with uh, without having any operational Navy fleet or anything like that. We can clear uh, the Black Sea from uh, Russian Black Sea fleet. It's... And no one would literally could imagine that this would happen. And uh, this is all thanks to the uh, technological progress and the creativity of Ukrainian commanders and engineers who have enabled this absolute heroes and uh, should go into the history books, I guess. Definitely. Well, let's turn to you personally, because you've had a huge impact um, through fundraising and through technological innovation, training support. But you're about to get married and you're about to join the army. What has led you to this decision? And why do you think you can have more of an impact by joining the army than continuing doing what you're currently doing? Uh, I think uh, um, to just add the remark to the previous section, it's uh, yes, I'm cool that I have been able to achieve this, but this is really achieved through crowdfunding and fundraising from ordinary people around the world. Uh, so we have like donations from 64 countries around the globe. And this is, I think, vastly uh, their achievement. And I'm just a little operational cog on the ground that helps uh, to make it happen on the ground uh, so just a field manager if you say uh, regarding the uh, decision to marry I actually I have the best girlfriend in the world and she's very awesome she's beautiful she's smart and we have been sitting on this kind of a decision uh, for for a long time already we are we've been uh, living together and traveling together uh, through uh, Europe through um uh, Latin America for quite some time and uh, this was awesome this is the best life that one can wish for to be in love uh, uh, so we decided um, I proposed uh, to her uh, just this winter and uh, she said yes uh, so we are just about to get married so today is like uh, uh, 12th of uh, June and we are getting married in about uh, Two weeks from now. I think that uh, generally to add more to this decision, I think that things that we have gone through in the last two years, uh, especially connected to this life and death uh, edge, uh, it bonded us very much and generally were is a very strong catalyst for any emotion and it just amplifies each and every emotion that you have in yourself. I think just by having this bigger bond, we are able to commit ourselves uh, as life partners uh, from now on. Uh, regarding the decision to um, join the armed forces, so I'm um, I'm about to do this right after uh, we get married and have a little of a honeymoon kind of a thing. 
to add more context, uh, in Ukraine, uh, uh, there is a, a public draft uh, right now uh, from, uh, I think, like 25 years old to like 60. And uh, uh, I, not, I have not been drafted yet. Uh, uh, I am only 25 today. Uh, my decision is based uh, on the fact that in these two years, I have been very successful in uh, building kind of a system uh, in the charity that I run. And uh, I have been able to build many processes, uh, partially thanks to my uh, IT background, actually. And uh, now it kind of works as a system. So I delegated uh, being the role of leader to my fiancé, Ira, and uh, she is going to lead it from now on. So I'm not worried about that part, and it's going to function as intended. Um, I'm more kind of a switching to another role of uh, being in the military. One might say that I am being promoted from the boss of the charity fund to the recipient of the aid of a charity fund. Um, I think that I'm very... Uh, as per my age, I'm kind of smart enough and educated enough, and I know a lot of things about the warfare uh, that I am able to make my contribution in the military. So presumably my role is uh, about to be anything connected with uh, the UAVs. Uh, so and mostly with uh, the recon, so I'd be able to detect uh, um juicy targets somewhere deep in the um, occupied territories. So Ukraine would be able to take out logistics. My goal is to uh, become uh, an, a military officer. So I'd be able to utilize all of my knowledge and skills and the um, knowledge of uh, good English to uh, help Ukraine win. And I just want to multiply the impact that I can do as a soldier. I want to have my guys in the unit kind of grow as well and uh, not be under some old stupid Soviet commander or anything. So, But before I do that, I must be a soldier myself and I must uh, go through the this hierarchical system that is in place in any army in the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I think I'm just generally um, a good addition to Ukraine's defense. Uh, if we are talking strictly rationally, if if we are talking conceptually, uh, my goal is to secure Ukraine's freedom. And uh, it is very painful to see my fellow citizens, uh, Ukrainians, lose their freedom. Uh, in occupied territories, because I know perfectly that all of them have tasted the freedom. And I think that there are people who are not able to defend their freedom. So I'm volunteering to do this on their behalf. So I want to defend first my personal freedom, freedom to live, freedom to self-determine, freedom to love, uh, freedom to think. And then I want to defend the freedom of my loved ones and then the freedom of my fellow citizens and of the whole country. As I am perceiving this Russian invasion as an existential threat that tries to uh, subjugate Ukraine into Russian Federation. So there is Ukraine Oblast instead than uh, Ukraine as a country. Yep, I absolutely understand that. Do you think the military is getting better at looking at people like you and saying, okay, well, you need the basic skills, but we're going to give you a task that really fits your, uh, you know, your skill set. Because I know during the first early chaotic days uh, of February 2022, a lot of people turned up saying, I've got this skill, I've got that skill. And it was like, well, what are you going to give me? Okay, go over here and fire a mortar or do something unrelated to your skills. Has the military got much more sensitive and much more, I would say, uh, economically tuned in to using people's, uh, utilizing people's skill sets? Absolutely, I would say. So initially, I think there was such an influx of uh, people who want to volunteer to fight. And actually, many people just were about to straight go into fight. This is exactly what they wanted. 
uh, right now we are in a more of a kind of a plateau in terms of uh, volunteers. So right now the ratio is about one to three um, uh, uh, with uh, respect to one is uh, people who volunteer and three people who are getting mobilized so they get drafted. Um, right now in Ukrainian military, you are able to literally pick a role on a public platform uh, online saying, hey, uh, we have this list of uh, uh, jobs that you can do in the military from starting from like, I don't know, like a cook uh, to uh, infantry commander to lawyer to uh, the boss of a financial kind of a branch uh, in the unit or anything like that. So this also includes the operators for UAVs, also includes the um, mortar man, artillery guys, and so on and so on. So basically, literally any job, you can find it online. You can fill up the, you, you can send your like CV and uh, uh, the unit would uh, contact you the next day. This is actually a process that I have uh, uh, done as well. And this worked uh, gracefully. This worked just perfect, you know. Uh, apart from that, you can directly go to a specific unit and say, hey, guys, I want to serve with you. And uh, they would issue like a paper saying, hey, this guy wants to serve with uh, our unit. And you would go to the military enlistment office, show that paper. It is legal because it has kind of a stamp of a commander and his signature on it. And they would uh, assign you into that specific unit. Uh, although you still have to go through your basic training course. So usually it takes, uh, uh, depending on the uh, training center, it takes people from one to two months. Uh, some people go abroad to train uh, for the basic boot camp. So basically how to hold a gun or anything like that. And it is required even for people who are not in combat roles. So even people who are doing like, I don't know, lawyers or anything like that. Um, so this is more or less the kind of a, a timeline. So you connect with the, the unit where you want to serve, take the paper from them. This guy wants to serve with us, go to the military enlistment office. They do all of the paperwork that is required to enlist you into military, to get you on your payroll and so on and so forth, process all of the documents, check that you are physically fit for military service. Then you go to the basic training course in Ukraine or abroad. Uh, and after that, you depart specifically to your unit. And if the unit thinks that you are already fit to do the job, then you are free to do it right away. If they think that you need any additional training, they send you to uh, another round of a training center. But that is a very specific training that you are going through. If you are, let's say, uh, a mortar man who never applied for a position of a mortarman, but you never uh, fired a mortar, you get sent to a training center that would train you how to fire a mortar. And in like two weeks or a month, you would be back in your unit and you would be able to start with the combat role that you have. There's an extraordinary level of decentralization to an extent that I would imagine um, does not exist in the army of the aggressor. I and mean, it's, it's a very different yeah. approach from this strictly vertical uh, structure that you'd expect in, say, the Russian army. Yeah, absolutely. Here, I agree 100%. And I have, uh, as I speak fluent Russian, and uh, I have been in a Russian media context for a while, I can see what they have in their mobilization and recruitment process. I have many relatives in Russia. And uh, what I'm seeing is that... Uh, um, one of the key drivers for Russian mobilization is uh, not mobilization itself, it's the recruitment and people actually volunteer because of the economical reasons. So you first artificially create kind of a poverty in the region. So the average salary would be like 150 bucks or anything like that, which isn't, isn't really suitable for life even in Russia. And uh, then you offer extreme amounts of money to as a sign-up bonus if you sign your first contract in the military. And that would be like, I don't know, six grand US dollars. And uh, then you have a salary of two grand, let's say. And people actually buy into the thing. They they realize that their day lives, days of life are numbered, but they still do this to get kind of better life for their family. I don't know. 
and in the end they end up in uh, Ukrainian uh, uh, POV camps or just simply killed at the battlefield because human life isn't really valued in Russia and they are treated as the cheapest resource often you know, with the uh, from no to minimal training and just uh, go assault that trench you know that kind of a warfare and this is of course why Ukraine must win because lives matter in Ukraine skills matter people are valuable resources rather than expendable I'd be really keen to talk again and especially after you've you know started your training and enter the military I think it'd be very uh well, I, I know the audience would hugely value a future conversation as you continue on this extraordinary journey that you're on. But Dimka, I'm so pleased we connected here. Um, so pleased that you came on the channel to share your insights with, with the channel. And of course, your extraordinary eloquent and clear articulation of what's going on. I think that will be massively valued by everyone on the channel. But thank you so much. Slavo Ukraini. Uh, hello, I'm Slava. Thank you, Jonathan, for having me over. Thank you, everyone who is going to listen to this. I am just, I'm just proud and happy that uh, I, as a Ukrainian, that I have this kind of a platform to to share my perspective, and uh, hopefully that uh, people are learning something new from this kind of on the ground uh, kind of experience. And I am, I would be more than happy to talk to you again. That was my pleasure, really.